Hey, let me introduce myself. My name is Kevin Rogers, uh, president of the Arizona Farm Bureau. I farm with my family in the Phoenix metropolitan area, cotton, alfalfa, corn silage, um, and some wheat. But uh, uh, with everything that's going on in social media today, this, this is a very, um, very good topic to have a good discussion on. And one of the things that I look back at as the president of the Arizona Farm Bureau is what, what has social media done to help help us in agriculture tell our story thus far. Don't have to think back too far to this summer um, when the Department of Labor put out their rule on, on child labor. And because the media got a hold of it and the social media kicked in and it ended up on Sean Hannity and everywhere across the country, uh, the labor rule was pulled back. And, and I attribute part of that success to the viralness of social media and how, um, how the public got educated on some of the silly things that were in that proposed rule where our kids wouldn't be able to, to clip their, their hogs or their cattle for 4-H and FFA and, and simple things that we take for granted on our farms that, that we allow our kids to do every day. So social media uh, is critical to, I think, our future. Part of the things we're talking about at the uh, AFBF level is, is President Stallman talked today at his address uh, with the Centennial Development Project is what are we supposed to look like the next 100 years? What, what are we evolving to? What do we need to be prepared to, prepared for? And I think uh, social media and communication is going to be a big part of our future uh, for the American Farm Bureau level. And so I think um, looking forward to a great session. And it's my privilege to introduce our uh, first panelist. Uh, Melissa is going to come up and, and introduce the rest of the group. Uh, but Melissa Bernist Berniston, very good, is a native from East Tennessee who's been with the Tennessee Farm Bureau Federation for nearly seven years. She's the Associate Director of Communications where her job centers around TV and radio broadcasting writing columns for the Tennessee Farm Bureau publications, keeping the web website updated, and of course, the social media aspects of her role. Uh, she does that through a couple different ways, Tennessee Farm Bureau on Twitter, as well as Tennessee Farm Bureau on Facebook, um, as well as her personal uh, Twitter page. She tells agriculture story day in and day out, and so I'd like to invite her up. I'd also like to thank Farm Family and American National for sponsoring this program for us today. Let's give them a round of applause. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't have any success. And please help me welcome up Melissa. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the other panelists to come on up. And while they're getting seated, um, I know that social media can be a pretty intimidating phrase, especially when you say social media, you immediately start thinking, oh, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's blogging, there's all these social media sites out there. How am I supposed to even think about getting started? So you start getting overwhelmed before you even begin. Well, hopefully after today's session, you will not only feel better about the dialogue that happens through social media, you'll be raring to go tell your story through one of those social uh, media channels that is out there. And we have a great panel up here that is going to inspire you to go do that. They run the gamut of not only social media experience, but agriculture as well. And I'm gonna start down here on my left with Zach Honeycutt. Zach is a farmer from Nebraska who raises corn, popcorn, and soybeans. He and his wife Anna serve on the AFBF YFNR committee. He's very thankful for auto steer in the tractor as it allows him to keep up with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and anything else he can do from his smartphone. At ZJ Hun is his username on Twitter and Instagram. Next is Katie Pinky. She is a North Dakota Farm Bureau member who was raised on a fifth generation farm family in North Dakota. Her, fam her parents still operate that farm. Crops they grow include winter wheat, barley, pinto beans, soybeans, canola, and corn. Katie is mom to three kids and her husband who owns a lumber yard and general contracting business that does 80% of its business in agriculture buildings and construction. She lives 97 miles from a Starbucks and her personal blog is thepinkypost.com. Another hat Katie wears is Director of Marketing and Information at the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. You can find her on Twitter, at Kat Pinky, and Facebook, Katie Lukens Pinky. Janice Person is a city girl who loves cotton and biotechnology. She works in Monsanto's corporate marketing team focusing on public perception and social media. Her work there includes blogging for MonsantoBlog.com and social media outreach. Her work there includes, oops, sorry, 
missed my line there. With a personal passion for agriculture, she also does social media on her weekends at JaniceParson.com where she talks about cotton, travel, and whatever else she gets into. You can follow her on Twitter, Twitter Instagram, and Pinterest at JP Loves Cotton. And last but not least, Ryan Goodman is a native Arkansan, currently a graduate student at the University of Tennessee. He has a strong background in the beef cattle industry, growing up on a large cattle ranch and working cattle ranches and feedlots in Wyoming, Oklahoma, and Texas. Ryan works to connect with others on farm and food topics on college campuses, through social media, his personal blog, and recently as a guest on CNN's food blog, Etocracy. He can be found on Twitter as AR underscore Ranch Hand. So first of all, let's welcome our panelists before we get started. I know a lot of times when you have a panel, you have these burning questions that you think of. So we are going to leave quest time at the end of this for questions that you guys really want to get down and dirty on and get answered. So if you think of questions throughout the panel, please write them down and we're going to have time at the end of it to answer those questions. But to start it off, the first question, you know, the obvious question that everybody thinks about is what is social media? But at this point, Everybody pretty much has heard of social media, so we don't want to focus on what social media is, but rather how we can facilitate the conversation to tell our story. So the first question I have is, um, let me get the actual question. Why should we engage in the social media conversation? Our expert panelists here probably have varied responses to this question. Transparency, two-way conversations, and a way to speak to a broader audience being among them. But I did want to open up that question to them to begin with. Why even bother engaging in this conversation? And anybody can jump in and we'll just let them answer the question. Well, I guess, um, you know, all of us here are involved in agriculture one way or another and um, you know when you get people in farming together we tend to talk about farming we enjoy doing that a lot and you know, it's kind of tough to do from the seat of a tractor and out planting corn or uh, if you're out irrigating or doing uh, anything like that and um, one thing I've been able to do a lot um, just with social media is be able to converse with people about what we're doing on the farm you know whether it's uh, other farmers around the country we can kind of share different practices or different terminologies or you know, different funny farm stories that we've we've heard or done with each other we can uh, build those relationships up but we can also um, reach out to people that maybe don't know much about agriculture and so it's a way that you can kind of do um, some public outreach from the seat you know doing your job out uh, out in the field so it's been a it's been a great way just uh, to not only get to know people in agriculture all over the country but also to uh, um, talk to people that I would have never had an opportunity to, to do otherwise. I guess I would just say that the reason I engage is I think everybody has to have a purpose if you're going to take the time to engage in social media. So I will tell you that not all the clothes at my house are folded at times when I'm engaging in social media, so I have to justify my time in social media. And I really felt threatened when I first engaged in social media and a bit defensive of what was being said about agriculture and my family's way of life. So I look at it as I want there to be a sixth generation on our family farm, whether that's our children or my siblings' kids or my cousins' kids. So at the end of the day, I want to engage with non-agriculture audiences that don't understand our families farm practices or where their food comes from and I just want to build a relationship with them so they trust a farmer and they I have all sorts of moms usually food purchasing moms that will ask me questions via email they'll if they're not comfortable commenting on my blog but they come to me because they're I might be the only person they know as a stakeholder in agriculture I don't have the answers for them in social media always but I can connect them to somebody who might so you know if you're going to engage in social media, just think of what your purpose is and why you're doing it. And it also makes my husband a lot happier when I can explain that to him. So. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, having worked in public relations for a long time, um, we've all seen kind of the images of American agriculture that you see on, on TV or that you see in the newspaper. And for me, it was a real game changer when social media kind of entered the picture. And um, having known the cotton business for a couple of decades, 
I'm able to create my expertise and become kind of a go-to person on the topic of cotton so that when something shows up in the media, people know who to talk to. That's really what is going on in today's social media is um, people are looking for first-hand information. They want to talk to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And, you know, there's going to be somebody out there talking about it. Um, I'd prefer it to be somebody that I know actually knows farmers or even better, know that they actually are on the farm and involved in that. And so that's really kind of making sure that we have a seat at the table and that some of us are, are taking that chair. And uh, the conversation may be different for each one of us in the room and different commodities and things like that. But being able to have a seat at the table for agriculture, and then I can always connect them to other people. You know, I may not know about pinto beans and things like that, but having established a, a, a presence out there in social media, folks who don't understand farming at least have a venue to get into it. So like Katie, I'm, I'm trying to really connect out to people that don't have a farm background. I, I can't say a whole lot more that three before me have, haven't already covered very well. Um, but for me, the biggest part is being part of the conversation, um, and, and it's happening. And I, I really realize this in person um, quite frequently, you know, whether it be in my community or on college campuses when I'm out and about and talking to folks. And they're already talking about what it is we're doing. And it's amazing a lot of the time the misperceptions um, that they get from secondhand sources. And so to be able to be a part of that community that is out there and we have the hands-on experience and we know what, what it is that we're doing in farming practices. And this is a really great media where we can have the, have the access to those folks who are wanting to ask those questions and already talking about it. And, and just to be a part of that community and, and being able to communicate and, uh, and see the light bulb moment come on for a lot of folks um, when they're wanting to learn um, and, and become enthusiastic and happy you know, and, and excited about learning about food and learning about farming and what it is we do on a daily basis. I, you know, I think, I think that's really just a, a great way to be a part of the community and, and, and to give back at times, too. Each of these panelists has a, a very unique toehold in the social media community, and I wanted to give them the opportunity before we delve too deeply into it to kind of give you a snapshot of, of some success stories that they've had in social media and really what um, spurs their passion to continue. So, Ryan, so you don't have to go last this time. We can go first. Um, share with us your experience through specific specifically through CNN's um, blog, Etocracy, and, and your success story through that. Okay. Um, when I started social media, um, it wasn't, okay, I'm going to go out here and advocate for agriculture. It was, I took a summer in Wyoming, and all of my family and friends wanted to know what it was, <laughs> you know, that I was doing. They wanted to see pictures of the mountains and the cattle that, that I was out there working with and all the irrigation work that I was doing. Um, and I, I didn't think that tromping in the mud was all that fun, but they wanted to see about it. And uh, so I started writing about it, you know, just weekly updates, and it was just my basic farm chores that I was doing. Um, and then I started having people following me that I didn't even know. And coming to find out, it was people in L.A., in New York City, Atlanta, that really wanted to learn about, you're out there irrigating, why are you watering the grass out in the middle of the range? Um, why are you pushing the cows up to a new pasture every day in the mountains? And, and so it really kind of started clicking with me. You know, people want to learn what it is that I think is, you know, just an everyday practice. And uh, so as it's developed over time, and I think that's really important about social media, you know, it, it, you know, it grows over time and with practice. Um, I started learning really good patience and being able to respond to these questions and critically think about them. Um, and, and that led up to, I was following CNN's food blog and they came up with the, uh, the pork and gestation crates issues. And there was a lot of negativity on there from folks who were from urban areas. And I'm not a pork farmer, I don't have a lot of experience with pork farming, um, but I know several farmers, you know, who do raise pigs and would be able to, you know, to help them. Um, so I just kind of gave, um, you, you know, a, a, a response to the article that I kind of thought out a little bit. And um, I didn't think anything of it, it was like I did on any other news article. And uh, this editor of the CNN page uh, contacted me one day and asked me if I'd be willing to write for him. <laughs> and, why, why is someone at CNN calling me? <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's really been a really great experience. I've written several articles for them that Melissa's kind of screening across the page here. Um, and, and the directive has been to consumers how they can connect with farmers. 
and ranchers and ask them questions and how to ask those people questions and learn more about where their food comes from. And uh, it's been a really eye-opening experience. I think one of my articles has a little over 600 comments from folks of asking these questions. And now we need farmers and ranchers to answer those things. Because I sure am not you know, experienced in poultry production or pork production. Um, and, and this is a really great way because a lot of these, you know, a lot of these questions really are sincere. And to be able to get out and to connect with these folks in NYC or LA and, and to just get, you know, to answer questions because these folks are interested in what I do on a daily basis. Uh, that's just been a really exciting, exciting time. And so that's, that's carried over and opened doors for many other farmers to be featured on CNN. And uh, it's, it's really been an exciting year um, to get farmers featured on one of the major news broadcasting stations. And I know, Katie, you mentioned uh, in the last answer about a lot of moms come to you, and you kind of have that instant uh, connection with them being a mom yourself. So can you kind of share with us how you can um, get that instant rapport and, 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 and your success stories through that? Yeah, so I also didn't set out on social media to talk about agriculture. I just was a lonely pregnant woman on the prairie, so I had to start a blog just to find friends. But... I, I really have found that I don't talk about agriculture all the time, and I intertwine it into what I, what I do, and obviously it's a big part of my life, but I found that if I talk about agriculture all the time, I'll really turn a lot of folks off. So I talk about our everyday life. For those of you that follow me, I share a lot of sunrises and sunsets because I seem to see them all on the prairie, and I share food. I became a part of a blogger group, Real Farm Wives, with Heather Hill, who's here and I learned a lot from Real Farm Wives and that's kind of a community I've relied on and learned that comments are candy, which Leah Beyer from Indiana taught me and that you have to connect with those other moms, you have to comment on their blogs, you have to engage in what they're interested in and they're interested in where their food comes from but they're, they don't trust you necessarily. So by building that dialogue, whether it's about your kids or if you'll see on my blog, I mean, it's redecorating my daughter's bedroom right now, uh, different <laughs> recipes. I'm just a family home cook. I'm not a fancy cook. Um, my grandma sometimes calls me and you know, critiques the recipes that I share. She has a home ec degree from North Dakota State University, so she'll tell me when I'm doing things wrong. But basically, I, I just found that there are a lot of moms out there that feel the same type of pressures that I do, raising kids and balancing family life and so then I start talking about our farm a bit here and there and connecting over to my mom's farm blog. I've really seen the ability to change a conversation for the good of agriculture and when I found out what my son was going to have to eat at school lunch this year in the public school system, I kind of started to make my blood boil because I have a six foot five ninth grader and he needs 4,700 calories a day to maintain his weight. And when he is gonna be limited to the calories that he was going to have through the school lunch program, we had to start looking at ways of how he could stay fed and, and have enough calories just to compete in football after school, to have enough calories to have energy for his classes in the afternoon. So I wrote a blog post about that and what was gonna happen and that we were gonna start packing lunches and no longer participate in our school lunch program. But then I also got pretty fired up, and it was really, it was Chris Chin from Farm Bureau member out of Missouri, and Val Wagner from North Dakota and I put our heads together, and we just started thinking about, you know, what can we do here, and started reaching out to as many Farm Bureau friends as we had and knew, and as many mom bloggers. And I asked anybody and everybody, I think I sent a Facebook message to about 50 <laughs> of you, and asked you to blog about it as well. And we just started creating that web. And it was Mace Thornton from Farm Bureau. He and I happened to be at an Egg Chat Foundation training and you know, in a bar with a napkin. Uh, created Sensible School Lunches Facebook page. He just gave me the encouragement that people would follow and it really caught on with Sensible School Lunches. We just really asked people to write the USDA and to talk to their school administrators, to talk to their elected officials, and create an outreach and just a grassroots effort, so encouraging the USDA to look at the regulations and the mandates put on the school lunch program. I guess 
what that taught me in social media is you can use social media for good and social media for change. And that community behind you, that those moms that don't know anything about agriculture necessarily, but they trust you and you've built, I've been blogging for five years, I've built that relationship with them, they'll rally for issues that are important to me. And it also impacts many of them. But not all of them are moms and they still vlogged about school lunches. And it was really important and they wrote letters. And I think that you can create change through social media and you might not know it, but you have to stand up and, and do it. And I think that it has the potential to do so much more for agriculture, but each and every one of us have to engage. And Janice, I know with your personal passion about agriculture, you um, have that drive to do it, but you also get a pretty unique aspect from being that uh, big ag Monsanto person where people who might be confused or dare I, say, dare I say angrily ranting about agriculture kind of take it out, I'm sure, on you at some point. So can you share with us um, your, your views on, on that aspect of social media and, and how you can... and maybe not change all of their minds, but at least get them to see the bigger picture. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to. It's, it's really funny because I got, I got to a job where now I'm devoting my time to social media because I was enjoying doing it personally. And um, as, I would, as I would be engaged personally, people would say, whoa, wait a minute, you, you work for Monsanto. That's, whoa, I, I heard about that company. And they'd ask me questions, you know, about Monsanto, things that they had heard. And um, through the process, we were really beginning to able to ask people to think twice. You know, what the media shows or what movies show doesn't necessarily have to do anything with telling the true story, but it's a story that sells sometimes. Um, and that's certainly the case with some of the movies and things that have depicted Monsanto's business in a way that doesn't reflect what a lot of farmers see. So a lot of times um, when I get somebody that, that gets in touch with me because they're very upset about a farmer going out of business or something they've heard, right? Um, you know, the, the magic pollen drift that's contaminated somebody's farm and, and led them to ruin is, is the kind of story I hear. And, um, and I've had the opportunity to kind of ask them, wait, wait, you know, like, I, I love farmers. I mean, I, I, I've worked in agriculture for decades. I mean, these people are my, my friends. Um, why, why would you suggest that? So let's talk about what's going on here. And, um, and with the, the world of social media the way it is, usually some other farmers and stuff can engage in that conversation with me. Probably the biggest success... Um, I had is, is not really on the Monsanto blog. Um, we, we're trying to do some different things there. But we also had the opportunity to host some people that had a really strong reaction to, quote, big ag at a, an event that USFRA uh, sponsored in Chicago. And I see Susie nodding her head because she was, she was there. She's a, a cotton farmer from Texas. Um, it was bringing foodies and farmers together. And, um, and we had created a gulf between people in the room. And one of the foodies had a really strong reaction and, uh, and went on a rant. Um, she was called the foul mouth food blogger by a lot of people. But, you know, she really, she had a hard time understanding agriculture because she'd been fed misinformation for a long time. Um, over the, the coming months, some farmers who are really actively engaged in Farm Bureau and social media started having a dialogue with her saying, well, wait a minute, you know, when you're, when you're talking about big ag, the way you talk about it, though, you're also talking about my farm. My farm's been a, in my family for five or six generations. Those kind of conversations made her go, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I don't have things right. And they started this blog that Melissa's got up there called 100 Meals. 100mills.com, it's all spelled out. And, um, and really, she went from somebody who was ranting and raving about the horrors of biotech and how farmers are being taken advantage of and things to having a well-rounded conversation about it. Now, granted, she's not still gonna be out there as a big proponent for biotech, right? She's, she still wants to grow her food in her backyard, which I think is awesome. Um, but at the same time, she's taken a lot of time to research based on other people having this conversation with her. And now she's out there and she's trying to help other people understand what's going on. And, and really, when you look at it in agriculture, there's that long spectrum 
and um, people that work for Monsanto are over here, and, and people who hate Monsanto wholeheartedly are over here. Most of the people are in the, in the middle part where it's kind of gray. When we reach out and kind of help ground those people with some sense of reality, it really makes a shift in the conversation. And that's probably, that's probably the biggest thing that we've got going on and, and where I think there's so much value to having lots of us in agriculture having those conversations. It's, it's whether it's policy, whether it's public perception, all those kind of things. We're only 2%, you know? When you look at it, in America, there's 285 million people. There's only 2 million farms. Those people have no way of understanding farms unless those of us in this room and, and at home on our farms are doing something about it. And social media kind of gives us that power. And, and the success story with Ellen and Grant, who put in huge amounts of work. I mean, the number of papers they've read, the number of questions they've asked, and you know, Susie's been right there having the conversation with them. It's, it's um, the ability to really change things. And what makes this awesome is she also works with a huge number of chefs, and they're writing their menus, and they're deciding what labels are important for food. So it, it really is a game changer for us. All right, um, Zach, sorry, you got the last straw this time. Um, as a young farmer and rancher, um, you have a, a unique story to tell uh, as, you know, the farming and ranching population is getting older. So you uh, can tell your story from the seat of the tractor. You also have, uh, you're a husband, you're a father, so you get to tell that aspect of the story. And you're involved in a leadership organization, so you're not only out there on the farm. So can you tell us your kind of unique perspective from that and kind of your success story? Yeah, I I always like to kind of say that I can give, I can give people a, a tour of our farm um, every day through Facebook and Twitter or Instagram, whatever. I'm able to, to give them a little peek into what, what I'm doing in south central Nebraska, you know, maybe a couple thousand miles away from where they are. Um, you know, I got to ta start taking a lot of pictures as smartphones get a little better and being able to uh, take better pictures. But um, you see up here, I kind of just start taking pictures of what I see throughout the day. This time of year, a farm in Nebraska pretty much looks white, so I don't have any <laughs> recent farm pictures on there, but, um, you know, take pictures of what we're doing at harvest time or um, take pictures of our pivots and explain explain why we need to irrigate, you know, explain how the, the drought this summer, how that affects us, and, um, you know, I could show people what we're dealing with, and, you know, that's that's not just, just useful to people who have no relation to agriculture, you know, they get friends in... Tennessee and North Carolina that want to see what what's going on, what we're doing, and um, it's just uh, you know right there, just um, showing what irrigated soybean field looks like, and um, you see some of the um, comments I get. I gotten hooked up with a guy from Tampa that takes a lot of pictures of sunrises and sunsets, and so I get to show him what sunrises and sunsets look like, you know, in the plains of Nebraska, and so he gets a little peek into what's going on um, on our farm, and. Um, you know, hopefully someday I'll be someone that he comes to if he's got questions uh, to talk about agriculture. Um, and, you know, I didn't necessarily start out in social media to do this kind of stuff, but it, it kind of naturally evolves. You see that happen just as you get to know people better. In real life, you start to, to share more with them and uh, talk about more of the things you're, you're passionate about. Um, you know, it's, and it's not all just, you know, sharing nice pictures and things. There's a lot of practical things I use this for. I was... Uh, Fortunate enough to be on a, a thing on CNBC uh, a year or two ago that was talking about a trading Twitter and um, did a series on uh, how commodities traders and, and um, stockbrokers are using Twitter to, to garner information. And um, so I, from that, I ended up uh, getting connected with a whole lot of commodities traders around the country. And so I can, I can look and see what they're saying, what, what they're talking about markets, what they think things are going to be doing. Um, I can you know, answer some questions for them about production and some of that stuff, which is kind of funny. You start getting farmers and want brokers to know what, uh, if their corn's doing really well or not. They do start to clam up a little bit because they don't want to be the ones to make the market go down. But uh, um, it is a really good way to, to get a broad-based um, look at what's going on, not just the one or two um, places that you get, the, get an email from or a newsletter from. You can see what, what's happening, what the thoughts are in real time. And uh, that's that's been pretty helpful and uh, obviously the other thing is weather. Um, always need to know what's going on with the weather and um, 
we've had a number of tornadoes kind of skim the edge of town in the last five years. And uh, one time the, the power went out, and the only thing my cell phone happened to still work while well, our uh, KRVN, uh, 880 AM, you know, big ag station in Nebraska, their Twitter feed was constantly updating where the tornado was, so I was able to know when the tornado would pass town, just follow them on Twitter in my basement. Uh, that, that's a pretty extreme example, but uh, that, that was pretty helpful at the time, and I um, mean, keep up with um, what's coming down the road. So, I mean, I, I think the, overall the most helpful thing is the, the connections you can make in that sort of stuff, but I also like the, the practical application. Um, the one other thing that I really started focusing on a couple years ago is seeing where, where was I making that impact and where did I need to make the impact. And with um, HSUS kind of putting Nebraska in its sights, I, I really wanted to kind of focus in on um, connecting with people more in my state. Because I thought at the time Twitter, I, it was much more spread out around the country and Facebook tend to be more my friends and family, people I knew in college and that kind of thing. And so um, I'd start posting a lot more about what we do on the farm. You know, we don't have livestock, but I could share about what, uh, you know, news stories I saw, maybe some friends getting featured doing something or uh, share some information from Farm Bureau. So I could start targeting that a little more to, um, you know, try to be, you know, I could connect them to people that have the, the answers for them or, you know, be an information source for them. Um, you know, talking about the Department of Labor um, regulations, trying to um, keep kids off the farm. I was able to take pictures of, you know, having my kids out, you know, how they, how they help, how we're learning, and how we keep them safe already, and we don't need a bunch of bureaucrats telling us how to do it. And I think that that's really helpful, and um, just, you know, taking some of that, that public perception that's kind of in that, that middle that can be swayed one way or another, and I think it, you know, we have a lot more um, sway if they're seeing it directly from us on the farm, and instead of getting, uh, you know, a you know, bureaucrats' word um, from some other source. So I think that's just been a way to just kind of, you know, tar target where you're, you're going to talk to and um, kind of become that expert for them. And I know it might seem when you hear everybody talk about their personal stories and their success stories uh, that, you know, I've been on Facebook for a while, I've been on Twitter, and I only have 200 followers or 50 followers. How is it that, that they can be up here talking about CNN and talking to, you know, um, market analysis people from all over the country or making a change through the USDA. So how do you guys get your brand or get your message out into that broad aspect of Twitter or Facebook or into social media? What are those ways that that individual producers or individual people out there can start getting into that mainstream and maybe not get frustrated if they're having a, a lack of, of repost or retweets? And anybody can jump in. I'll go ahead and, and start. I think um, I think it it becomes intimidating if you're if you're not doing it already, right? And and seriously, you see farmers that have ten thousand followers, and and most of us really don't have a drive to do that. Um, what ends up happening though is when you make real connections, we don't all have to have ten thousand followers. We need to be transparent about what we're doing. So. If you're on Facebook already and, and you have a personal page for farmers, I'd suggest you set up a, a page for your business for your farm. And you start talking about what you're doing on your farm on that page. And you ask people in your community, people you went to college with, people at church, all those kind of folks. Would you mind, you know, I'd love for you to like my page and see what we're doing here on, on the farm I have. And from that, I mean, it, it, it's really small concentric circles. And over time, it makes a big difference. The reason I'd suggest you put it on a page on Facebook instead of your personal profile is because then it becomes search engine friendly. And that way, you also don't necessarily, if, if you want to friend everybody on the planet, go ahead and do that. But a lot of us also want to keep something that's, quote, private time and um, be able to share family photos and, and things that may be more personal. That lets you kind of have that two-step. Same on Twitter, if, if, you're, if you want to get onto Twitter, I'd find one or two hashtags that, that mean something to you outside of agriculture. And I'd try and focus on one or two hashtags and interact with people who share your passion. I, um, I talk to a lot of people that love travel. I do it a lot and I love it. I talk to a lot of people who, who love photography. You know, by following a couple of hashtags specific to the things I already love, 
we have shared mutual ground. I mean, it's really easy for me then to, to follow somebody else that's talking similar topics, and it's easy for them to want to follow me. Then later when they, you know, they're also seeing the farm kind of things along with it, and later when they have questions, they know who to ask a question. So those are the top tips for me. <coughs> I'll chime in, and since my mom isn't here, I'll use her as an example. And I would just say, first and foremost, like Janice said, doing one or two things really well makes a difference. You don't have to be everything to everyone, and don't spread yourself too thin. But about four years ago, as you know, the closer to home you get, the less you know. I kept on telling my mom we needed a farm blog, and my mom didn't believe me because I could be working with agriculture clients across the nation when I was working in the private industry and helping these companies do that, but my mom didn't believe me. So she agreed uh, that my sister could start our farm blog, and we did that, and when my sister went back to college for her senior year, we taught my mom who I can say her age since she's not here, 58 years old, to block. And Better being recorded. Yeah, I know, she'll watch this. <laughs> but that's okay, she, um, because she's done Jane such a good Lucas. job. And the reason I, she, my mom is not sharing this on Facebook or on Twitter. My sister and I do that for her, but we taught her how to take pictures off of her camera and put them onto the computer and to do blog posts. And the only thing we asked her to do was be consistent. And I think that's really important. You, if you're consistent, you will build community. And that community will become your advocates for your message. And my mom, I just told her, because she doesn't look at her traffic or statistics, I do. And I just told her, you know, the blog just had its highest amount of traffic in, in this last December. And we've been doing it for three and a half years. So she's just been really consistent. And when <coughs> Bloomberg Business Week was Googling you know, authentic, innovative American farmer search terms on Google trying to find uh, an American <coughs> farmer to feature in Bloomberg, they just kept on getting Jane Lukens at Griggs, Dakota, because my mom has been blogging five days a week for three and a half years. And I finally, at Christmas, she took a little break, but she schedules in posts and she was featured um, because she was consistent between the former Secretary of Labor, Conan O'Brien, and the CEO of Home Depot as and was able to be a voice for American farmers and in that feature. So, you know, be consistent and just choose one or two things and then just make that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be fancy or flashy. My mom just shares a lot of photos and a few words. So, consistency. Uh, one thing that I found that um, was a little unexpected that uh, using social media and um, some of this stuff is I, I actually found a pretty good connection with uh, traditional media outlets. Um, our, you know, I mentioned KRVN being on Twitter and um, a lot of our local TV stations and newspapers have been pretty active on Twitter uh, for a while and I've been able to form some um, good relationships with some reporters and um, some writers around us that um, so when, when they have questions about farming, they, they'll come to us if they want to do a quick little feature on uh, you know, maybe estate taxes or the drought or um, how's harvest going. Um, we're, we're near the top of, um, of their list for people to, to come out and talk to. And so that's been a, a good way to, um, to really just get, get more of a, uh, an agriculture message out there is to, uh, to use that traditional media, you know, make that connection through, through these newer methods that, you know, like, I wouldn't just call up a, you know, NTV News and um, start asking for the station manager and tell him I want to talk farming, but he can see what I'm posting and he can come find me and um, we can uh, talk about agriculture. So that's been, that's been a good way, um, I would say, to, to kind of get into that mainstream because I know that, um, that as many people as I know in Nebraska that are on social media, I know I'm going to reach more people um, around Aurora, around Grand Island, Hastings, Kearney, if I'm um, on the local news, then... Um, uh, doing some of the stuff on here. So for making that, that local impact, um, getting involved um, with some of the, the traditional media outlets has been a great thing. Yeah, Zach makes a really good point about kind of being local and reaching out to the media. Um, my family cattle auction is just your average size auction in Arkansas. Um, you know, my dad's a single owner and manages it, and he really didn't have a, a lot of time for social media, um, but I set it up automatic feeds. Um, where we have our, uh, our weekly market report posted on a website and any special sales or auctions that we have. And so I just kind of set it up 
you know, it just took a couple minutes to make an automatic feed to, to our Facebook page and then through Twitter. And, uh, you know, just kind of maybe market to, uh, to some of the local customers. And we connected with the, with the community pages, you know, just kind of like them and our community and everything and, and started connecting. And there's well over a dozen new buyers that I brought to our cattle auction last year because we just shared our market report and interacted with, you know, the local community businesses on Facebook and Twitter. And it's not like we put a lot of effort into it. It's just, you know, just keeping our customers up to date. But they really appreciate, hey, I can get on my phone and look at the market report from my local auction barn. And they really appreciate that. And now we've got people from, all, you know, across the state that are coming and, and doing that. And we've, we've connected with local media in the same way that Zach has. And, and they'll kind of call him up and ask, um, you know, you know what's, what's going on with this. And we had the drought in Arkansas and this last year. And... I mean, we've seen ponds, my grandfather saw ponds dry up that he's never seen, you know, and he's 80 something years old, uh, never seen dry. And uh, we ended up, you know, getting on, you know, getting the local news out. And it wasn't just, you know, hey, look, we got on the local news. It was, you know, helping the, the locals understand why are these cattle all going to auction? Why do you see hay trailers traveling down the interstate? And we're able to help find hay um, for a lot of folks, a lot of our local customers. Um, by being able to do that. Um, and, and so we talk about social media and advocacy and, and being on a national scale, but it can be a very local thing too. I, th I think that's really important to recognize and, and it can be a really good way to network, work, network with your local customers. So you don't have to be really big on a large scale. It can be a very, very centralized thing. And, and I, I think it's a great way to, to connect with folks that, that we've never been able to in a way before. And one more thing I'd just um, add when we're talking about how to get that mainstream attention is um, wh whatever you're going to get on online and talk about what, you know, if, you know, maybe you're just into agriculture and that's great, or maybe you've got other hobbies to use to, to connect with people. Maybe it's following college sports or uh, cooking or uh, playing music or whatever. I said, be, be positive all the time. Don't, I mean, you don't want to get on there and um, turn people off with, you know, saying bad things about other people or complaining and be passionate. Um, I, I mean, I think people would listen to a passionate description of paint drying um, <laughs> if, if more than a, a dry speaker talking about, you know, the secrets of the universe. So, you know, I, you know, following Janice for a few years now, I, I can say I wouldn't necessarily go on Twitter looking for information about cotton and that wouldn't necessarily catch my eye, but She's pretty passionate about it, and I've read a whole lot more about cotton than I otherwise would have just because, you know, that passion draws people in, and she's relentlessly positive online, and that's, uh, that's pretty tough to do with all the uh, Monsanto stuff that gets thrown her way. So uh, that's, you know, wh whatever you choose to, to do online, however you choose to do any of that, that's, I'd say be passionate and be positive, and whatever you're talking about, you're going to make an impact. Do you guys think it's important to have a mentor or someone that if you are just getting into Twitter or Facebook, talk about uh, the importance of, of maybe just dabbling into it before jumping in, you know, head first or, or diving in wholeheartedly into a bunch of different um, uh, social media networks? How, what is the importance of, of uh, mentoring or having someone to look to in the social media field? I guess I would say listen first. So you can find who your mentors are. I would say all of these folks up here with me right now, they've been mentors to me. And there's a great sense of community that you find when you start looking for those mentors. But you all know the people in our everyday life that just talk, talk, talk about themselves all the time. Nobody really wants that in social media either. So you have to engage in the conversations that you can fit into and kind of jump in, but you have to listen first to find out where those conversations are. So that would be my advice that yes, have mentors. Everyone up here has been a mentor. Many of you in the audience have been mentors to me, but also sometimes you also have to go where others haven't gone or you have to go somewhere that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. I went to the Blog Her conference in New York City and wore cowboy boots and wranglers. And I can tell you I was the only other woman, other than the pioneer woman, Ray Drummond, wearing cowboy boots in New York City. But sometimes you have to do that. And I, I did that with three other women from agriculture. And we were the only women from agriculture that we knew at Blogger. But we built connections with non-agriculture bloggers that we wouldn't have gone or ever known. You have to have offline connections just as much as you have those online connections. Um, 
but don't, don't be afraid to just listen first and find a couple of mentors that can lead you and then go maybe where nobody else has gone that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. I, I agree with Katie. Um, I, I think all of us have mentors every day, whether, you know, whether you're at home on the farm trying to learn to do something a little different than you've had to deal with or you know, whatever it is, social media is very much the same. Um, I think it's, it's one of those things that some kind can be a little hard for some of us who maybe have a few more gray hair than Ryan um, or something like that and, and, and things. But I mean, if you talk about what you want to accomplish on Facebook and Twitter, you can, you can help figure out a lot of stuff, and maybe there's somebody younger in your farm that really wants to be engaged and wants to make a difference and would love to help you figure out how to do some of those things. I mean, to me, there's, there's some real advantage in understanding your mentors may actually be in your own farm because maybe they really enjoy doing Facebook or, or something already personally and then find it a great challenge to take on to do something for your farm. Um, otherwise, Almost every commodity group and every uh, state farm bureau has had some inc incredible training events. I mean, I've been to a few of them, and, um, and there are great people to be found, if not on your immediate local level, because I know some of us are in, in further out communities, but there's definitely some folks on the state level that if you just put out a call to uh, your, your farm bureau communication staff, folks like Melissa, I bet you you'd start finding mentors if you didn't know who, who to ask. And, um, and I think the value there is, is pretty significant because they can just help you focus your time on something that's going to make a meaningful difference. You know, if, if you're going to invest time in it, it'll at least make sure you're making a meaningful difference instead of you doing something that 50 other people have done and found out it's not going to help. I mean, I don't, it, it, may, it may work for you, but you know, maybe your first few things, you know, it's nice to see your rewards and see real feedback and, and contributions. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I get teased a lot about, <laughs> we had a conversation the other day that the movie Top Gun is older than I am. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true that, you know, that, you know, I, I may be pretty young and, and social media may be seen as a young person's game some of the time, but I go talk to a lot of cattlemen's groups around the area, and I, I tell them I need mentors online. You know, even though I may be savvy, you know, more savvy than some folks in the social media stuff, is that I need folks who have experienced agriculture for several years and have, and have experienced the things that I will encounter. And I need the folks um, who are the older generations to be able to be there for me to ask questions or to say, hey, Ryan, you know, <laughs> watch your comments to get into this, you know, that conversation or something like that. Um, and, and so social media is just a translation of relationships from real life. I mean, you know, it's still talking to folks just like we would, you know, going down to the, to the convenience store or to church on Sundays. And so it, folks like me, we really look for, you know, for the folks that, that are wiser and, and can be our mentors in, in you know, life lessons and encountering these things. So, you know, if, if nothing else, just, just think about it. There's a lot of folks like me out there that are looking for, for folks to sometimes keep us more in line and guide us and be a, be a voice in the conversation, um, you know, that, that comes from wisdom. Um, I think that's a really great value, uh, value to put. And we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to cut us, our panelists, off here because I want to leave time for any questions that people in the audience may have to ask our panelists. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, I got a microphone. Okay. Um, I follow two of you. I am Agriculture Proud and Pinky Post through Facebook already. <laughs> and so. How many of your followers are already in the agriculture field? Because knowledge is key. We're grain farmers um, from southern Illinois, so we don't know anything about cattle um, or what it's like to live on the prairie. Um, so how many are already agriculture-based that are following you, but then how do you deal with the criticism of those who don't agree with what you do? I do have a large number of of agriculture followers, and I follow several because that's my, you know, my main interest. Um, and so we do have a lot of experience being swapped there and a lot of farm stories. But I also have a large number of folks who, especially since I've begun writing a few pieces for CNN, 
um, from folks who are who are in urban areas and suburban areas, and they want to, you know, what is what is it like when I'm going out and I say I'm working cattle? Um, and, and so sometimes I get get some negativity, um, especially on the antibiotics, hormones issues, um, and, and that I think responding to that takes a lot of patience. Um, and, and when we say the negativity is there, it's not like it's you sign up for Twitter, you're going to get a ton of negativity your way just because you shared a picture of a cow in a pasture. Um, you know, it, it comes along along the way, but it's not, you know, the forefront of the conversation there. Um, and so I think dealing with the negativity is, is just all about the patience. Step back and think about um, how, how to engage this person in, in a, a productive conversation. Yeah, I'd say I, I always say you know there's there's a there's a face behind the username. You know, you're talking to to a person, not a username. So you just kind of handle it like you like you would in real life. If someone came up to you with a question about something or had some kind of negative to say about either your what you're doing agriculturally or what someone else, it, you know, and whether it's cattle or whatever, what they're doing, <laughs> handle it like you would there. You're going to be patient with them, like Ryan said. You're going to. Um, you're going to ask some questions. You're going to find, you know, figure out the best way to answer the question. That, that's that's kind of been my approach. I, I tell you, sometimes it really helps to have a different voice for agriculture out there. I mean, you know, last year the problems in the cherry industry in Michigan. I wouldn't have known anything about it if it wasn't for Ben Lacrosse and people like him in Michigan, right? And so it's the kind of thing that, for those of us in agriculture, we can help pa pass that message forward and at the same time be reaching some of the folks that are outside of agriculture. Um, I'm really lucky since I'm from the city, all my family, all, you know, everybody I went to school with, they all wonder how I wor ended up working with farmers all the time. So I'm a really unique case on that. But I, I spend a lot of time talking to people in agriculture who don't understand what's happening in my part of the world. I mean, you know, it's, it's nice that we're all together and we're all Farm Bureau and we're all, we're all kind of family, but a lot of times we don't understand what's happening in another part of the family and, and to kind of create that sense of community through social media is really helpful as well. I call you my ag ninja and that is we need this agriculture community to be a part of our social media community because when we take a stand on an issue, which has happened to me before, and the non-agriculture community is maybe not going to see it the way I see it. I might be, you know, have a completely different perspective, but I decide to blog about it. And this happened to me last winter. I had blogged about a conversation that happened in real life on the airplane with an animal rights activist sitting next to me. And I wrote a blog post about it, and the comments were going really well until a Friday night when I was at my son's basketball game and the comments started going really negative. And I couldn't moderate that from my phone at a basketball game. So I was able to just send a text message to some of folks in the ag community and just ask them, would you please go onto my blog and write some positive things and help? And by Saturday morning, by the time I got back to my computer, that conversation had changed positively. So my audience in social media, my number one audience is not an agriculture community, but I do need that support and I think all of us have to support one another. Uh, I think that we need each other for backup and we also sometimes if I'm going to write a blog post on maybe a controversial topic, I will reach out to others in the ag community that I think have a deeper understanding of it and just offer some insight before I hit publish. Um, before I get attacked and knowing that those in the ag community will support me. And I know within Farm Bureau that a lot of even those within the agriculture industry may have differing views on issues. So on Farm Bureau's post we have to make sure that we are going to be able to answer questions from not only those outside of the agriculture industry who are Farm Bureau members through our insurance company, but also those who may be in East Tennessee versus West Tennessee and have two different ag mentalities altogether. So a lot of times, even though you may have followers from the agriculture sector, they're still going to have two completely different mindsets and still need to hear that message. So I think we have to keep that in mind as well, that sometimes, although we may think we're just preaching to the choir, there might be two or three or four completely completely differing mindsets on the same issue, even within the agriculture field. Other questions? Yes, sir, right up front. What are you looking at right now? 
This is a live Twitter feed on this uh, website, it's called Twubs, and basically what it is, is if you are on Twitter, there's a hashtag, and if you put this pound AFBF13 on Twitter, your post, everybody that's posting about Farm Bureau Convention right now is on this feed. If, does that make sense? Did I explain it? <laughs> Basically, it's how you search on Twitter. If you put that pound sign and then anything else, you will be able to search that information on Twitter. So that's, that's how you put a post to have people find it. And that's really cool because that's also how you find other people that share a topic of interest to you or that are at the same event or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, if you're at a, a football game, they may be using the same kind of hashtag. You know, or if, you, if you're big on travel or food, you, you do that so more people can find your information. Any other questions? Okay, well, I hope all of you are ready to go out. And if you haven't signed up for Twitter or Facebook or a blog, I hope you're ready to go start it and start sharing your story. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms. They'll be at the back to collect them. And thank you for attending today's session.